Hey, it's great to see you this morning. Go ahead and grab your Bible. Uh, if you've been here much, I know some of you are new today, turn to the book of Galatians. You'll find it in the, the New Testament. We've been walking through it all summer long. And uh, what a summer it's been. And as Megan noted, real excited about the days to come. This is the week. This week, uh, we're kicking it all off. And it is exciting to be back. I mean, fully back, even after a couple of years, back to ministries and things that we've done in the past and some brand new things, in fact, launching a new uh, gathering of men on Tuesday morning. Um, I want to encourage you to come and join us on Wednesday nights. And again, as she noted, the, uh, the Grow booklet itself and online will tell you everything you need to know about where to get plugged in. Uh, some of you like to personally invite you to uh, a, a new apologetic, a class that I'm doing for six weeks on Wednesday night as we consider how to uh, embrace all that's taking place in our culture today from a biblical standpoint, and then how to engage our friends, family, and uh, coworkers, uh, classmates uh, with the gospel. And it's a challenging thing to do, but we can do it. We can do it with grace as we express truth and share the gospel. So I hope you're, um, yeah, I hope you're cooling off a little bit. It's below 100 degrees these days, so that's a good thing. And hope you're having a wonderful Labor Day. Some of you are watching us online, many of you are, and some of you maybe because you're out of town or doing something a little different today. Uh, I hope this summer, at some point along the way, we, uh, our family, hope you are able to get away maybe from the heat or get away from your normal rhythms. Uh, many of you know that for a week uh, in late July, we were able to get away to one of our favorite places up in Colorado. And one of our favorite things to do um, is to go hiking when we're up there. Now, if you're going to take a serious hike, uh, you better take a guide with you, at least somebody who's done it before. Like you're going to climb a challenging 14er. Uh, you need somebody who's done it. And uh, so in the past, I've done a little bit of that myself, and uh, it makes all the difference in the world. This is true in all of life, isn't it? To have somebody who's done it, like walk alongside somebody who actually has done it. I don't know if you've ever gotten lost on a hike. Nowadays, it's kind of hard to get lost, maybe in your car, but we still do it, don't we? Admittedly. Or get lost in, in a store, in a mall, or somewhere. Uh, wouldn't it be cool to have like a spiritual GPS all the time? Like Google Maps, you know exactly where you are, you know exactly, like the map is laid out, or maybe what is Siri, somebody telling you, you know, turn right, right now, you know. Wouldn't it be amazing to have that? Of course, if you're a Christian, if you're tracking with me, we do. We have exactly that, and it's the Holy Spirit who lives in our lives. Today we're going to talk about the work of the Holy Spirit and how he guides us and leads us. It's the very Spirit of God that, li that lives in us and how we can not get lost, but in fact, take every step that he wants us to take. The Bible says, as we'll see today, it's keeping in step with the Spirit. Now, all of this happens before, I mean, after something else happens. Something happens before all this. See, what makes you a Christian We've been talking about this for a long time and here throughout the summer. What makes you a Christian is not a new resolve to work harder, right? It's not a new moralism. Like I'm finally gonna get my act together. The Bible tells me how to get my act together and how to live just as I should. Yeah, it does that. But something happens before all of that or we're off track. We just follow after another religion that bears Christ's name. It's called Christianity. The Bible says, in fact, that being a Christian means that you've experienced spiritual resurrection in your life. In fact, Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to get to Galatians in a moment. Ephesians 1, 20, it says this. You can see it there. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. This has been my prayer today for you. In order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance, in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. The power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. You've probably heard this like me before from a preacher like me who says, the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. That's what Paul's saying here. 
And if you've heard that before, like me, you might at times think, likely today, I, I don't feel that, that powerful today. I mean, that, that is an amazing thing. I, I don't know. I think there's, a, there's an intellectual, even experiential disconnect for us. The question that I want to ask you today, as a Christian, here's the question. We have the power to change within us if you're a Christian. And we'll talk about that quite a bit today. The question is, do you want to change? Like, really, do you really want to live differently? To name even particular sins, identify sins, which is really to confess and agree that this is sin, and then to repent and to live differently. Today, we're going to move to a very practical part of the book of Galatians. We find it in chapter 5. You can turn to Galatians 5. And we're going to talk about how to walk in the Spirit. We're going to talk about how to obey, how to overcome sin. And what we're going to see here, Paul will define this journey, okay, that we're on. He's going to describe it uh, through, by way of contrast, two different ways we could go. And then he's going to tell us what the destination really is, okay? So there's a definition, there's a description, and, and there's a destination in all of this. He's been on repeat, if you've been with us, if you read the book of Galatians, he's been saying that you're saved by grace with one-way love of God, all that Christ has done for you through faith, not works. And he's been offering every possible angle that he can think of throughout the first four chapters to tell us all about this. He's used the personal, historical. Uh, he, he's used the emotional. He's used the allegorical with Sarah and Hagar. And now he's going to shift to the practical. This is something, if you watch for it, Paul does this in every one of his epistles, he does it in the book of Romans, he does it in his writings, where he moves now, you could say he moves from orthodoxy to orthopraxy. He, he moves from what we could call the gospel indicatives, if, if, English teachers, indicatives, just statements of fact. This is true, this is true. He spends four chapters on this. This is what Christ has done for us. This is what he has done. This is what the gospel means. This is how faith works, if you will. This is how you're saved. Jesus has accomplished all this for us. Gospel truth. Then he shifts to what you could call gospel imperatives. Now he's going to say, how do we appropriate all this? And he does this in every book. This is worth noting. You've got to understand what Christ has done before you ever move on. And even then, we've said it, you don't move on past grace. Grace is the great motivator in our lives. Always going back to the gospel and what Christ has done. This is where we get tripped up. And this, you'll see today, is why we can't overcome sin. You, you, you can, and I want you to identify. And we have a hard time doing this. I want you to identify sin in your life. Like sins. I want you to identify. Maybe it's a habitual sin. And I want you to identify. Maybe it's an attitude of the heart. You've got to think deeply about this. Let the Spirit speak into your heart, even as I, as I preach here today. Because what we're going to see today, Jesus says, which is so countercultural in our day, Jesus says obedience is actually the pathway to freedom. Obedience is the pathway to freedom. See, see if you define freedom, we've said it, as removing all limitations and many people in our culture do today. Some people think that anything or anyone that I am to obey is restrictive, binding, and oppressive. And we hear this constantly. But all of us know this. You don't have to be a Christian, a religious person of any kind, to know this. If you strip away all the limitations from your life, you will self-destruct. Every one of us. It's what the Bible calls sin. And it's interesting that the Bible says, Jesus' words, that really those of us who are in sin are lost. We're on a path. We're climbing up the mountain and we have no, we have no guide. We don't know where we're heading and we're lost. And so what we're going to learn today is that we can actually experience the, the greatest joy. See what it means to have this resurrected spirit within us? Our motivation shift. Now, your greatest joy, mine as Christians, is to obey him. This is our greatest joy in life. Jesus said, you'll know the truth 
And the truth will set you, what? Free. And then he goes on to say, I am the truth. He says, I'm the way, I'm your guide, I'm with you, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and the life. You see, Christian obedience, if you've been around here much uh, in our church, you, you know this, Christian obedience is not an impersonal transaction. It is not a rules and regulations, it's not principles to follow. It's a relationship with a person, Jesus, and we follow him. See, the Christian life really is a journey. It's a walk. It's a journey. In fact, Jesus, when he came on the scene in, in Isaiah 61, he, I, mean, I mean in Luke, he, he, he reads from Isaiah 61, and he launches his ministry. It, it's the passage that points to the servant of the Lord, the, God, the Messiah to come. And he says, I've come to proclaim freedom to the prisoners. I've come to release the oppressed. He says, I'm all about freedom. And it's so interesting that, that the world sees us as Christians, as those who are so legalistic and just following the rules. And that is not what the Christian life is about. And friend, if you're here today or hearing my voice or watching us online, you need to know that. Christianity is not another religion, albeit the best one of all. That's, that's not what Jesus came to bring. He came, in fact, to set us free. And freedom comes by his spirit in us, giving us the power to live the life we ought to live. In Galatians 5, verse 16, we're going to begin there, verse 16. We're going to go through verse 25, and you're going to find here within this text, very, very popular uh, scripture that is the fruit of the spirit. In chapter 5, if you've been with us much, uh, you know that he began uh, with this shift. The shift starts taking place at the beginning of chapter 5, which I think is why it's broken down this way by commentators or those later. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free, he says in verse one. Uh, now this sounds um, like just kind of repetitive, redundant, but what he's saying is, okay, okay, so we've been set free by faith and not your works, by faith in what Christ has already accomplished. Now, it's freedom now throughout the rest of your life. You're to live in this freedom. And then he goes on to say in verse six, he says, being religious or not religious, doesn't account for anything, doesn't matter. Religious, irreligious, only faith, this is an interesting phrase, and it'll play out in our sermon today. Only faith working through love. Wow, that, that's an interesting phrase. He said that's what it all comes down to. But he says, don't use your freedom with licentiousness as an opportunity for sin. And instead, stay busy serving each other or you're gonna consume each other if you don't outgrace each other. And then he moves to this next verse in, in verse 16, and I wanna begin with now the definition of the journey, all right? Then he's gonna give us a description and the destination. Look at verse 16. But I say, but I say, instead of all of those things, you're gonna consume each other, stay focused, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want. Look at this, opposing desires is what he's talking about. Important phrase to remember or word to remember. We'll unpack that a little bit more as we have. Here, Paul defines the Christian life as walking, right? He notes there are two pathways. Uh, our sinful nature, in contrast, another translation says, in contrary, it's contrary to the desires of the spirit. There's a war going on. And it's a war of desire. It's not like you're gonna not desire. We're created with desires. Desires are a good thing. In fact, desire is why we worship God, as we'll see today. Desire is good, but both are about desires. This is interesting to know. We've said this, if you were here, uh, I think a couple of weeks ago, I noted this. Um, the word desire in the Greek is the word epithumia. We said that epi is a, the prefix in the Greek means over uh, or on or upon. And it's really like a superlative. It means over desire, super desire. Epithumia is a word that we see over and over again in the New Testament. And it's an important to understand it in this light. This has been, this has been life changing for me. Uh, it's often translated lusts, which is a bad translation, I think. Um, 
because it's so much more than that. And because in our culture today, we think lust, we think sex. It's actually an over-desire. We've said that sin is more rightly understood as an over-desire for good things that we've made God things. This, this concept can be life-changing. We, it's an, it's an uber, uber desire. It's, it's an over desire for things that we, we search for to find our identities. Okay. It's hard to say, we don't often say you, you can lust over your job, super desire, over, uh, desire too much from your work. You can lust after money. We might say, well, I get that. We can lust after our children, our family. We can lust to be the perfect parent. We lust after comfort. We lust after power. Now we might say, yeah, okay, I, I get that. But this word lust is actually, epithumia is a critical word, hard to translate, but it means over desire. See, so sin is not simply a desire for evil things. It can be that. Sin is much more often an over desire for good things that we've made God things. In fact, I would argue that love out of order, as Augustine called it, is why we, why we, we enter to every sin because our sin is actually a relational problem. It's a relationship problem. God not taking his rightful place in our lives. In other words, put it another way, you are controlled by the love of your life. Every single one of us. If you love applause, you're going to do everything you can to get it. If you love the approval of others, you're going to just bend over backwards. It's going to drive your life. If you love comfort, you're going to do whatever you can to eliminate anything that brings discomfort in your life, and you'll never grow. If you love power, you're going to step over people to get there. You see, whatever you love is going to drive your life. Whatever you, whatever you worship. That's why we talk about idols. The Bible talks about idols. We have all given our hearts to something. And today, this day, the Spirit will speak into your heart as you determine, focus in, let the Spirit speak to your heart. What is it that is more often, most often, uh, to become your idol, that, that uber desire, the over desire in your life that then drives so much of what you're about and why you lust, have desires after things of the flesh, not of the Spirit. So what or who is really Lord of your life? Now, here's what's interesting here. Discovered this, even in my studies this week, the desires of the spirit. So if we understand uber desires, over desires, lusts, the same word is used. There's this lust of the, of the flesh. There's lusts of the spirit. Again, sounds strange. Same word because of our, our sexual connotation. Sounds weird. What does the spirit lust after? We're going to get to that in a moment. That's the thing. Those are the things we want to lust after, right? We want to desire. We want to over desire for those things. The spirit has super desires too. The Christian life, listen, is shifting your desires away from the flesh and to the things of the spirit. Look at verse 18. But if you are led by the spirit, you're not under the law. Now, you're tracking with me there, and now you get, he's, now wait, he's back to the law. Now he's talking about religion again. What is this? I thought he was getting practical. This is very practical. There are two desires, the flesh and the spirit. If you're under the law, you live a life of condemnation. You live under the law, you def, you're defined, your life is defined by guilt, shame, and a constant need to try to appease God. Am I doing enough? I got to do more. I got to, I got to prove myself. I have to, here's the word, justify myself. And you're enslaved. You're enslaved to the lesser desires of the world, the desires of the flesh. This is why he says, if you are under the law, you are, you're under the, the desires of the flesh. This is what he's saying. He's still contrasting this here. And so to understand if I have one, however, who loves me, even though I'm not perfect and I'm embraced by him, then I am free. I'm free from fear. This is where freedom really comes through, come, comes from. And then I can live out, here it is, my faith. I live out my faith by expressing itself in love. That's where all of this goes. I can actually look like Jesus. And so if you never believe the gospel, 
friends, listen, you will remain under the law and always wonder if you're doing enough because you never will. And it's a constant life that runs to the things of the flesh. Never is there a greater moral transformation in a heart than when you're captured by the grace that God has extended to you. And here's the shift. Then you finally have a shift in desire. You want to, watch this, your motivation changes. You want to obey him. That's the problem with many of us. Just say no, stop it, stop sinning, quit that habit. Not, how's that going for you, by the way? That's not gonna work. Never has it worked in my life, never will it work in your life, until you have a desire that supersedes all desires in your life. When you look at something that you think is beautiful and then you see something that is more beautiful, that's where your de desire shifts. It's why Thomas Chalmers, I've referenced before, he was a Scottish preacher. He said the gospel is the expulsive, we don't use that word often, the expulsive, like explosive, but expulsive power of the new affection. It's a, it's a new affection. Expulsive means eliminating, a purging power. See, when we understand what Christ has done for us, it's why we always get back to the gospel. Remind me again of how much you love me. Every day, friends, if you're going to walk in the spirit, you've got to continue to go back to what Christ has accomplished for you and remember who you are or you'll continue to seek the things of the flesh and desire the things of the flesh. You can't simply show something is wrong and then just say no. You cannot do it on your own power. You need to try every method to see, every possibility to embrace the greatest love of all time. It's why being together in worship, I applaud you, I commend you. You're being reminded even now of the greatest truth you're gonna know this week. It's so important for us to be together. It's why we're constantly saying, come grow with us. Come join us this week. Come find your place, get together. Let's talk again about how much God loves us. So he defines the journey as one that's pursuing Christ ultimately. But he says, you know, there's, now he gives a description of this. There's two ways you can go. And now he describes it, watch this. Now the, the works of the spirit, this is verse 19, works of the flesh are evident. Now, Tim Keller has noted there are 15 words here. Seven are sins of irreligious people. Eight are sins of religious people. As if to say, this covers all of us. Because watch this, the, uh, for irreligious people, let's say, uh, sexual immorality, that's the word pornea, um, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery. Then he goes to drunkenness and orgies, which I think is a bad translation, by the way, carousing, uh, reveling, partying. Both the la those two have to do with, with, with substance abuse. It, it has to do with overindulgence, each, each of those. And we would all look at those, that list, and go, oh, yeah, that's, yeah those are bad. Those are really bad things. We, we, I don't, we don't do that. I get it. Well, the drunk part. I, well, anyway, but I mean, there's some things. That those are, those, but watch this. Look at the others. Enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions. Those are things that, I mean, tribalism polarization, disunity, even in the body. I mean, that stuff happens in the church. Those happen among religious people, Christian people. Then he says in verse 22, but the fruit of the spirit, now watch this, not fruits. This is my preacher pet peeve, not fruits. Fruit, meaning produce, the result of. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, everybody together. Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Then he adds, against such things, there, there is no law. Don't worry about it. It's like Augustine said, um, love God and do as you please. There's no law against being just like Jesus. If you're filled with the Spirit, desiring the things of the Spirit, why is it fruit, not fruits? Here's why. It's like looking at a diamond, flashing a light on it, and then light is refracted out. We've done a whole series on this. You can find on, on our website. But, but you see this, it's love. The one thing is love. Multifaceted love. In fact, let's just take a quick 
Quick stock of your life. And by the way, this is on our sermon response guide. Broken down. We've, we've done a whole series on this. But love, think about it. I want you to see. This, this is where we can say, ooh, I need to grow here. Lord, give me a greater desire. The opposite of love, you could argue, is not hate. The opposite of love is fear because, because uh, perfect love casts out all fear. See, love is self-protection. I mean, I mean, fear is self-protection. Love is self-giving. It's self-opening. And then joy is, is, is really inviting God in and focused on the intrinsic value of who he is. That's joy beyond our circumstances. The counterfeit for joy is to focus on the gift and not the giver. And the counterfeit of love is really selfish affection. I'm going to love you because you're going to love me in return. What I get back from you. That's not love, right? Peace is confidence, trusting God's in control. Patience is the opposite of anger, where we forgive others. Kindness is, is a generous spirit. It's a generosity of spirit as opposed to envy. That's kindness. It's delighting in other successes. Goodness is, is sincerity, integrity all the way through. It's goodness to the end. It's, it's a holistic goodness. You're going you're gonna to do what you said you're going to do it is what really faithfulness is, is being reliable. And, and gentleness is actually humility as opposed to pride. Self-control is always choosing the best thing, the important over the urgent. And so all of these are expressions of love. And this is so important in our culture today. I've talked about this, but uh, David French, who is probably my, one of my favorite cultural commentators, he says the problem in our day is that we're very bold about our convictions, many of us as Christians, and often, too often, really bold, clear, and often uh, aligned with some partisan view. And we're really certain about these things. They're non-negotiable. But then we get to the fruit of the Spirit and the way of Jesus negotiable and in so doing thinking we're right we are wrong because Jesus is perfect theology to live like Jesus is the goal right so he defines the journey he describes it there and then he moves on to the destination and we'll close with this ironic twist the destination of the journey not not to a, a, a place not to a new moral position those are false peaks but to a person. You see, the destination is to a person, but watch this, not, not just ultimately see him face to face, but to remain close to the person, our guide, Jesus. It's the very spirit of, of God who lives with us. So what do I do? Two things, two things we need to do. The first one is to crucify your evil desires. Crucify your evil desires. There's a two-step process here. Uh, how do you go about doing that? Well, look at what he says in verse 24. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Now, why does they say crucify? Why don't you say just kill it? Just stab it. Crush it. You might say, well, crucify. That's what Jesus was crucified. Okay. Yes. But he's saying this. Yes, we die to ourselves in the same way. The cruciform life. He's saying, Here, here's what we need to do. All of this is in light of the cross. I, I give up all things because of the one who died for me. This epi desire, this, this great desire is for Christ now. As I know what he's accomplished for me. And this is the cruciform life. And it's why baptism is so critical. It's, it's when we launch into this life. I have died to myself. I'm, I'm raised up again, resurrected life, new desires to follow Christ every day of my life. Friends, and I'm going to be so bold to say this. If you've not been baptized, it's not a means towards heaven. It doesn't get you there. But it is critical. It, it's like, you know, often I say it this way. You know, well, Jeff, that, that's, that's just a ring. Like, you're still married. You don't have to wear a ring. No, you know, no big deal. No, 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 no. This is not just a ring. This is a wedding ring. This ring means something. I committed my life to Stacy, my wife, and this ring represents that. Oh, a baptism, you know, no big deal. 
I mean, like, you, you know, it's, it's an ordinance. You, you, don't, you can be saved and go to heaven without that. It is a big deal. And I can say for some of us here, it's why we are defeated and weak in our spiritual lives because we've never made the proclamation that this is who I'm going to be. Crucify the flesh, live for him. And I'm saying all that because we've got many who need to be baptized. And if you're here today, maybe you didn't come for this. We got an outdoor baptism September 25th. You can get baptized next week. We can baptize you. Come and join us. Come find us after the service. We'd love to talk to you about that. And then the last thing is to keep in step with the Spirit. Look at verse 25. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit, in intimacy with Him. So I said the Spirit lusts as well. What's the uber desire of the Spirit? Jesus said the Spirit will come in John 15, 26. And He said the Spirit will proceed from the Father and He will bear witness to me the spirit will point to me you see we walk this is so important we walk by the spirit because the spirit of God in you and me today will keep pointing us to Jesus look at him glorify him praise him look at what he's done the role of the spirit is to keep us focused on the greatest desire of our lives this is why the unbeliever without the spirit in them can never can never pursue the things of the Spirit. Only the believer has this power that no one else has. So friends, if you're going to go for a climb, if you're going to hike up a 14, you better take a guide with you. And as you leave this place today, you need to focus on the finished work of Christ. And he has done something, given us something, for us to be white-hot focused on what he's accomplished for us.